It is April 1st, 2019, and you're back with John Lorden. And Daniel Hallen, and we are happy to have you here, and you're lucky we didn't do an April Fool's joke on you. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yes. I you're... would have given it away regardless. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we, we did consider it, but <clears throat> Danielle said, you know what? Anyone watching the video isn't going to believe my, my expression, <laughs> basically, so. <laughs> I'm not good at anything like that, ever. Well. Oh, well, that's okay. That's okay. We can continue without an April Fool's joke. This is Crime After Crime, and we wanted to let you guys know before we jumped into today's episode that we do have a few spots left for the First 10 group. If you want to come to CrimeCon, come to New Orleans, spend some time with Danielle and myself, you can be part of the First 10, get into a special event, have a drink with us, get a free t-shirt, get all kinds of free merch, including the Crime After Crime Stress Ball and the crime after crime refrigerator magnet and a whole bunch of other stuff we have planned for you guys. <laughs> Tons of goodies. And on top of all that, there are a bunch of other true crime YouTubers that are coming. We've got Amber Loves Mystery, Stephanie Harlow, John Crimes, of course, Danielle Hallen and myself, John Lord. And this is gonna be the biggest group of true crime YouTubers to be at one place yet. And if you wanna be a part of that, Danielle, tell them how they can do it. You guys can learn more about this by watching the video pinned at our Twitter account. If you go to at crime after pod, or if you guys look for the video on our YouTube channel, that's named want to hang out with us at crime con. It's going to be a good time. You guys, and we really want you guys to be there. Absolutely. Also remember that you can come to our Twitter account at crime after pod to vote for today's episode, who you think told the best story. There is a poll that will be there for seven days after the episode is released. Or you guys can vote on YouTube after months and months of deliberation. We have finally figured out. It's very easy to vote at any time you want to during the video. There's going to be an I, the letter I in the upper right hand of your co right hand corner, if I can get my words right, <laughs> of the screen. You just hover over it with your mouse if you're on a desktop or a laptop, or you just simply touch the screen if you're on mobile. All you have to do is hit the I, and you guys can vote for who you think brought the best story. And that leads us into... Drum roll, please. V voting results. The voting results <laughs> with Danielle for last episode, most unbelievable elderly criminal. All right, are you ready, John? I don't know, am I, Danielle? <laughs> <laughs> you guys know John has dominated the past few episodes, but this time I finally made a comeback. Twitter poll, I was at 79%, and John was at 21%, and then on YouTube, 88% for my story and 11 for John. So I officially am going to be taking the mug back. Yeah, which way to, here we go. Take the mug back. You go ahead. There you go. Um, hold on a second, hold on a second. This is April 1st, Danielle. Are, are you trying to punk me here, uh, or are these numbers right because my butt hurts from this. Are you kidding me? 88% versus I 11. I was looking at that. I think that's actually the largest difference we've had so yes. far. Yes, by far. And I learned a very important lesson. I want to thank everyone that voted on this. I learned that no one wants to hear about a 70-year-old prostitute. That oh, I, I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think it was great, Danielle. <laughs> These numbers are telling me <laughs> that it wasn't all that great. <laughs> so I will never bring up a septuagenarian prostitute on this show ever again. Well, I personally loved it, and I saw a bunch of great uh, conversations going on in the comments about many different topics that were brought up from your story directly. Okay. I, I still loved it, and I still voted for you, and I still think you did a great job, John. Well, I you think just whooped my butt too many times, and I had to come back and roast yours. You so. really did. You really did. I'm telling you, I'm sore from that one. That was amazing. My hat's off to you, Danielle. Really good job. And there were some people that were kind of talking about, um, you know, oh, I'm sorry, John, but I'm going to have to vote with Danielle on this. And I'm like, hey, don't be sorry. What This is great for the show. I think. I know. We love it. Yeah, we absolutely love it. And 
I love that we're being pushed into these challenges with the research. I don't get challenged like this with my typical research that I do on the YouTube channel. Yeah. And today's episode is no exception at all. This is Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. This might be the toughest research job that we have done yet. Today we are talking about the world's worst alibi. Danielle, do you agree? Tough research job? Absolutely. And I had to kind of make mine fit into a bad alibi. So mine's probably totally even going to be out of left field. This was one of the hardest research jobs ever because we actually discovered quite a few things in our preliminary research. And I think John's about to kind of get into this in a minute, but it was difficult. I dare every single one of you to go and look up alibi stories online and let me know what you think afterwards. You're going to be shocked. The interesting thing is most people, if they just do the preliminary look, if they didn't have the same rules that we did about this, you are able to find tons of lists of alibis. But when you look into the lists and you look into the details of those cases, they're not actually talking about alibis. No, not at all. So that's what we learned. And yeah, I, I, I honestly didn't even really make this distinction myself until I took on this research job. So what are we talking about? Alibi in Latin literally means somewhere else. According to defenselawyer.com, uh, criminaldefenselawyer.com, an alibi defense is a defense based on information that a defendant was not at the scene of the crime when the crime occurred, that he was somewhere else and could not be the person who committed the crime. The defense can have witnesses testify and present evidence at trial to support an alibi defense. The credibility of witnesses can help bolster or weaken the alibi. If it's a family member, a judge or jury may wonder if they would lie to protect their loved one. A witness who doesn't know or isn't personal with the defendant can actually help strengthen the alibi. Most states require that a defendant inform the prosecution before trial if an alibi defense is being used within a certain time period. If the defense ignores that requirement, the defendant may not be allowed to present the alibi at trial, which makes sense because there's a discovery yeah. process where the prosecution's supposed to know the approach and be able to address it. So there's a very big difference between an alibi and what most of those articles were actually citing, which were excuses. I found several articles claiming to be a list of bizarre alibis, and they were mostly about excuses. A few of them in particular, thank you, Listverse and Cracked.com, <laughs> featured lists that didn't have one single true alibi. I was questioning everything I've ever known. You can ask John, you can ask my <laughs> husband, you can ask my father-in-law, you can ask anyone who spoke to me these past couple of weeks because I mean, I thought I had a great understanding of what an alibi was and then I saw all these lists and I'm like, wait a minute. Is this the same thing as an alibi? Like, am I wrong? Am I right? Was my thinking flawed from the beginning? I was over here messaging John frantically, probably not making any sense because you cannot find a single list that actually has an alibi in it. It's all excuses. And we both ended up stumbling upon the fact that it does literally mean somewhere else. And yeah. I, my husband's father, it, he was a police officer. So I was calling him and I was like, I, I need help. I need you to clarify something for me because I feel like I'm losing my mind. It was bad. Yeah, hard research job. I think, I think it, it's such a hard research job because a true alibi, something that does prove that you were somewhere else, will probably usually come out through the investigative process before the trial and will lead law enforcement into a different direction. We see this all the time in cases. Uh, yeah. Someone is looked into and they have a true alibi. They were with their girlfriend at the movies, and it's proven because they have a receipt from the movies. There's footage of them entering the movie theater. That is an alibi that at the investigation level, they're going to stop at that point and say, well, we can't try to charge this guy. We know that he was at the movies. So trying to find where it actually an alibi comes into a criminal proceeding at trial is, I think, what made this such a hard challenge. But we both stepped up to the challenge. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Danielle. Danielle, tell me your story. I'm really, I'm dying to hear this. Oh my goodness, mine's a mess, but we're gonna, we're gonna go with it and hope for the best. <laughs> so most people that have been accused of a crime immediately jump their alibi to escape charges. But what happens when your DNA is found at the scene of a murder 
and your memory from that night is completely gone, and you think you have an alibi, but you're not positive. Lucas Anderson found himself in the middle of this incredibly bizarre situation, and he didn't think he committed a murder, but he wasn't sure. You all are probably like, forget it. Cancel. <laughs> so on Vote midnight, now for John. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it sounds crazy. It actually ties in, though, a lot to what we were just talking about. Yeah. So on midnight, November 29th, 2012, someone broke into 66-year-old Ravish Kumra's home. Ravish was an investor, and he lived in a beautiful 7,000-square-foot home in Monte Sereno. And the perpetrator or perpetrators found Kumra sitting in his living room enjoying the nighttime news when they decided to tie him up blindfold him and gag him with duct tape. Mm. His partner was upstairs asleep in the bedroom and was dragged downstairs and tied up right beside Kumra. And while the couple sat confused, bleeding and bound, the burglar took it upon themselves to raid the entire house. They took all the expensive jewelry and any money left lying around. And when the house finally became quiet, Kumra's partner, who was still conscious, fumbled her way into the kitchen to call 911. She reported that there had been a break-in and an assault, but she was still blindfolded and completely unaware of how serious the situation really was. Wow. This is terrifying so far. Oh, it's so twisty, turning crazy. So immediately authorities sped to the home of Kumra, and they found that he had died from the assault. The duct tape that had been placed over his mouth also covered his nose and ended up completely suffocating him. Oh, so man. an entirely heartbreaking and senseless murder. And these people probably likely didn't go into it expecting that to happen. Right. But the authorities desperately searched the home for any sort of evidence they could possibly find, and after three and a half weeks, they believed they knew exactly who committed the crime. Authorities had spent, sent plenty of items off to the lab for forensic testing, things that the perpetrators likely would have touched. There was a handful of gloves that had been left in the sink, and they appeared that they had been washed, almost in an attempt to get DNA off. They also had fingernail clippings that they took from Kumra and the tape that they had used to gag him, and they ended up finding DNA on every single one of those items. Oh, wow. The, uh-huh, I know. To me, everything from this story start to finish is just wild. Yeah. So... They found DNA on the duct tape from a 22-year-old known criminal named D'Angelo Austin. And on the gloves, they found DNA from 21-year-old Javier Garcia. And there had been DNA found also on the fingernail clippings belonging to a man named Lucas Anderson. Okay. This is damning evidence. You yeah. know, you hear DNA and you think, absolutely. So 26-year-old Lucas Anderson was a homeless man at the time, and he didn't have a spotless history by any means. He was a known alcoholic. He had actually been homeless for his childhood as well. So pretty much his whole life, it caused a lot of different mental issues, alcoholism, and he did have a lot of small offenses tied to his name. So they brought Lucas in and accused him straight out of murdering Kumra, expecting to see a reaction other than what they got. Lucas seemed to be incredibly shocked and confused about being brought in for this crime. And when he spoke to the public defender in Santa Clara County Jail in California, it was clear as well that he was still very confused. He ended up admitting that he had a drinking problem, so while he didn't think that he'd ever be capable of murdering someone, he wondered if he did it and just didn't remember. Mm. So obviously his new public defender was not pleased with this answer as likely a crime like this would be punished by a long wait on death row. Yeah. But authorities told them exactly how they pinned him to the crime. It was DNA and that they weren't getting out of it and he was thrown in jail and charged with the murder of Kumra. As weeks went on, authorities were able to pin D'Angelo and Javier, the DNA that was found on the two other items right. to this crime in multiple ways. They were in a gang, and this gang was known for a string of robberies, and D'Angelo's sister was also a sex worker, and they had found out that she had had a relationship with Kumra for 12 years, and she had actually given these young men a map of his house so that they could successfully rob it. Wow. But other than the DNA, authorities couldn't really find anything to link Lucas to the crime. He did have a past felony for residential burglary, but other than that, there was nothing. But they continued to charge him. After more digging, they did eventually find a link. Lucas had been in jail at the same time as one of D'Angelo's close friends for his previous burglary conviction. Mm-hmm. 
The man, D'Angelo's close friend, he had an ankle monitor on, so they decided they were going to track his movements to see what was going on, and he had actually driven to San Jose, and this is exactly where Lucas was staying. And he was going to almost the exact location where Lucas was known to hang around the most. So very, very specific place. So at this point, authorities believe that when the planning was being done for the break-in, these people knew that the house was going to be more difficult. A 7,000 square foot house. Right. So they wanted to get someone who was more experienced. And they believed that Lucas had known D'Angelo's friend in jail. They were well aware of what his conviction was, and they had set him up with D'Angelo and Javier through this guy, which is why this guy went to San Jose so many times in the days around the murder. So at this point, they knew he was guilty. They absolutely knew it. They held him for over a month. I think it was a couple months. Um, They had, in fact, charged him. They continued to come in and question him and accused him over and over again. They really were hard on this guy, like incredibly hard on him. So his attorney had to get to the bottom of what happened that night to build his defense because with Lucas being homeless, that's kind of hard to do. And when he doesn't remember what he was doing that night, you know, it's difficult. So it's not like he went home with anyone that could give him an alibi. He didn't have a job that could really vouch for him. So every single detail that could be found on Lucas was collected to try to find some sort of alibi because at this point, he was about to be sentenced to death. Yeah. This is when his medical records revealed something that saved his life and the only time being a drunk has ever helped him. Okay. (laughs) So at 7.35 p.m. the night of the break-in, a clerk at a 7-Eleven had to call authorities on Lucas because he was panhandling. But before authorities arrived, he moved on to a place called SNS Market, and this was about four blocks away from the 7-Eleven. And he sat down right out front of the store at around 8.15. The clerk knew he was there and realized that he was obviously drunk. But for hours, he continued to sit in front of the store, just pounding back the drinks. And finally, he walked into the store and collapsed in one of the aisles from intoxication. Wow. So the clerk called 911, and an ambulance came to get... Lucas, and he was admitted to the hospital at 10.45 p.m. that night. So no wonder he didn't remember anything, and he didn't believe he would do it, but he wasn't sure because he was belligerently drunk. Yeah, blackout drunk. Oh, yeah. So the doctor confirmed that he did keep Lucas overnight to sober up. He was not released until the next morning, but that meant that there was no way he could have been at Coomer's home at around 11.30 p.m., the night that he was murdered because he had just been admitted to the hospital. Wow. Wow. Oh, it gets so much crazier. (laughs) It's already pretty crazy. (laughs) So he had an alibi. He was passed out drunk in the hospital, an alibi that he had forgotten because he was drunk. Right. That he didn't know he had. Yeah. So, but how would this alibi stand up against this DNA evidence? He was already being charged for it and... I'll get more into, you know, some details later, but you know, how did his DNA get there? You know, how were they going to fight that? Because as you saw, alibis, you know, they had to make sure he didn't somehow get out. Um, Alibis, you think they're kind of a serious thing, but unless you can, I mean, prove them without a doubt. Right, right. And even sometimes they still question it. And I wanted to throw this fact in here real quick, but in a study, it is found that if DNA is involved in a case, 95% of people automatically assume guilt without questioning the DNA. Mm -hmm. So this was going to be a giant task for the defender because he still had to fight to, you know, be proven innocent. His DNA was found. So they tried to see if maybe somehow Lucas came in contact with Kumra in the days before his murder, but they couldn't find any sort of link in any of the days surrounding. So they started to go through his medical records again, and they found something mind-blowing. The same paramedics that picked up Lucas just hours after were at the crime scene of Coomer's murder. Oh, man. It Cross-contamination. was, yes, they somehow moved Lucas's DNA to the scene of the crime, and wow. after a little bit of researching, they believe it was done through the pulse ox that goes over people's fingers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was a complete freak occurrence. Wow. 
He luckily had an alibi that led them to this, but he wasn't even aware of his own alibi because he was belligerently drunk. He almost confessed to this crime multiple times because he was like, they have my DNA. I must have been there. Yeah. And he's used to blacking out. So he's like, well, could have been. Yeah. Exactly. I I, I don't know what I did last night or last week or last month. Yeah. And he always said, you know, I'm not that kind of person. I, I could never see myself kill anybody. But I mean, the DNA was making him question himself. Right. So he luckily, again, had this alibi, but if someone else hadn't had something like that, they easily could have been charged with murder. If this had been any other situation, if he hadn't, you know, collapsed in the middle of the aisle because he was so belligerently drunk, he would absolutely be in prison right now for the murder. Right. So they ended up apologizing to him and the real murderers were charged. D'Angelo and Javier were guilty of the crime. But wow, imagine thinking you're guilty of something because you can't remember because you were drunk and then being drunk saves you from being convicted of murder. Yeah, yeah. What a stroke of luck. That is, that is an amazing, amazing turn of events in that story. Wow. <sighs> yeah, it's, oh man, it's, it's bad. And I actually got a couple, I did a little bit of research on touch DNA, what mm-hmm. specifically this all came from. And... I kind of fell down a rabbit hole, but apparently a ton of different tests have been done throughout the years on the transfer of DNA and how it can affect these cases. Because again, as I said, 95% of people see DNA and they think they're guilty. This man even had an alibi eventually, and he still had to fight right. to, you know, to maintain his innocence. And I found that one in five people have someone else's DNA under their fingernails at all times. <laughs> wow. That's ter- I'm scared to touch things. I'm scared <laughs> to go out anymore. People actually have a shedding status. Right. You're either a good shedder, you put your DNA basically all over everything, or you're a poor shedder, and you can go through life completely undetectable genetically. And it changes a lot based on personal habit. You know, someone that bites their nails or touches their face or anxiously rubs their skin, puts their hands to their hair. If you're doing something like that all the time, you could be putting your DNA all over everything and you have no idea. Right. And luckily, again, he ended up being able to find an alibi. Yeah. But imagine if you didn't. So let's say you touch a handle and you're someone that doesn't wash your hands frequently or picks your nose or does something else. You know, what if a murderer comes in, touches the same handle, has their DNA, your DNA all over their hands and then strangles someone? Wow. It's going to look pretty guilty if your DNA is all over their neck. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this isn't something that happens. It's not incredibly common. So I'm not trying to scare everybody, but it was very crazy going into this after reading this story and seeing how it definitely can happen. It's happened. It's happened quite a handful of times. Actually, most of the time people have been in prison. Yeah. For years, years and years. And then it's found after the fact that their DNA just somehow shed and ended up at the wrong place at the wrong time. And this poor drunk guy had no idea. It's so important that we remember that DNA in itself is not necessarily the answer. And I I don't want to cross over too far into my other show, Three Men in a Mystery, but we're dealing with this right now in that case as well, because we have a guy that's been identified through DNA, but the DNA sample is a semen sample that was left on a victim that they don't think was sexually assaulted, but they did find semen on her clothing and skin. And they've now identified the person that it looks like is the depositor of that. But does that mean that he's the same person that shot those girls? Yep. So there's, it's interesting because I'm watching this whole community go through this right now of trying to understand what DNA is and what it really means and does this necess- necessarily mean that they found the right guy. Um, and it's much different if you're talking about DNA that has been found on a weapon. Yeah. Something where it's really obvious. There's still a, a layer of investigation that needs to be considered when it comes to DNA. DNA can give you a link to the truth but if people look at it as the truth in itself, you're gonna run into situations just like the one that you've covered here. And I've heard of another instance of this kind of cross-contamination problem with DNA uh, where there were several cases that were being investigated and they kept finding this DNA sample, but then they were entering it into CODIS and then all of a sudden people in other states were like, hold on a second, we've got that same for a different crime that's out here. And all of a sudden, 
someone finally figures out the swabs that they're yep. using were contaminated by someone at the factory and that person's DNA was winding up in all these cases. They thought they had a mass murderer that was, you know, traveling the world essentially killing people. Yeah, and I saw that story. Yeah, ultimately it came back to the swabs being <laughs> contaminated. So But you know, imagine, you know, you find this DNA, but I mean I mean a freak chance that he was drunk as all get out that night and he right. that poor I'm being so serious I look at pictures of him and he and some of his quotes and he had no dang idea if he did it or not and he kept saying I don't think I did I think I might have an alibi but I don't know it's amazing because it's like the stars had to line up just for that possibility to exist but then the stars the and the moon stars. and the sun all had to line up oh. to get him off that is bizarre wow well, Danielle, I don't know what you were so nervous about. I think you absolutely knocked it out of the park with that story. And uh, for alibi, yeah, absolutely. First of all, not only do they have the medical records showing that he's in the hospital, but I bet the store that he went and stumbled into, they probably had video footage of him <laughs> captured there. The testimony from any of the doctors or people that treated him while, I was, while he was in the hospital would probably support the fact that he was non-functional. You know, he's not roaming the halls of the hospital when he's been completely blacked out to the point where he's mm -hmm. fallen down in an aisle. So, and I can only imagine what authorities said as well when the when his public defender walked up and was like, "He didn't do it. He was drunk. <laughs> right. He was bl he blew. He was blacked out. <laughs> That's why he can't remember anything." <laughs> oh and what a gosh. good job! What a good job that public defender did to be able to trace all that and to, to figure that out. I was impressed. Yeah. I was thoroughly impressed by this story from many different angles. Yeah, yeah. Good job, Danielle. Wow, super interesting. See, not technically like the worst. Being drunk isn't necessarily the best alibi, but I, <laughs> no. That, hold on. What are you trying to say? Way, a story was way too crazy to not say. I yeah. couldn't not tell that one. Yeah, yeah. No, no I, you know, um, yeah. Maybe I, I sh if I'm going to do anything really bad, maybe that'll be my next alibi before I go um, doing my low speed car crashes <laughs> oh, in in my retired years <laughs> that I keep talking about. Um, wow. All right. Well. I think I'm ready. You ready for mine? I'm ready for yours. All right. Well, this story, uh, it sort of straddles the line a little bit between excuse and alibi. But the defendant clearly stated that he couldn't have committed the murder because he wasn't there. He was busy that day walking his dog and running errands, including buying a dozen or so bags of heroin. <laughs> Well, that's one way to walk from one crime right into another. <laughs> yeah, seriously, huh? And that's that's a heck of a walk you're taking your dog on. I know. Uh, <laughs> New Jersey, <laughs> Sunday, May 12, 2013. Tony Verdicchio went to Mass at St. Paul's Lutheran Church and after decided that he wanted to pop in on a friend who was teaching Sunday school to wish her Happy Mother's Day. At 76 years old, Tony had a pleasant life going for himself he lived in the Pine Acres Manor Mobile Home Park and loved to go to flea markets to work on his various collections. Tony collected baseball cards and Disney figurines and was known to be a bit of a creature of habit. The kind of guy that got his morning paper from the same newsstand every single day and would often go twice a day to have coffee, visit with friends, and chat. He headed home after church that Mother's Day to change clothes and was planning on heading back out with a friend to continue his hunt for collectibles at a local flea market. Unfortunately, Tony's plans would be brought to a tragic end. He was brutally assaulted in his home with a hammer. The following day, he didn't show up at the newsstand. A few friends went to his home to check for him. They found Tony not breathing and partially covered up by a blanket and a plastic bag. In his hand was a piece of paper with an impression of some kind on it. He was taken by emergency services, but unfortunately would not survive. Police couldn't find any eyewitnesses to the assault. There were no fingerprints found, and even DNA analysis wasn't helpful in this case. It did look like some items may have been taken from Tony's home, but a lot of valuables were left behind. Was this a robbery gone wrong? Investigators started looking into Tony's life and heard from his friends that he mentioned helping out a neighbor with a loan. That neighbor was 57-year-old Alan Binkowski. Binkowski wasn't hard to track down. He was already in jail on a different murder charge from about a month prior. Uh, 
the shooting oh and robbery i know seriously uh when you're going looking for your suspect and you already find him in jail yeah i'm pretty sure that the prosecutor's not a feeling, good sign yeah and the prosecutor's feeling pretty strong about that case um so the murder charge from prior was the shooting and robbery of a 56 year old man named michael wells police interviewed benkowski and found that when he was questioned about his whereabouts on may 12th his story kept changing they also learned that he had recently rented a storage unit. Benkowski was charged with first-degree felony murder, first-degree robbery, second-degree unlawful possession of a weapon, and second-degree possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose in the Michael Wells case. His bail on those charges was set at $1.45 million with no 10% cash option. Uh, he would also be charged with first-degree murder on Tony's case, with the bail being set at $3 million cash only. The trial for Tony's murder began in late January 2016, and the world would find out what evidence pointed to Benkowski. The impression left on the paper in Tony's hand turned out to match Benkowski's shoe print. When oh, invest wow. Yeah. When investigators got access to Benkowski's shoes, they tested them, and they found Tony's blood on them. Investigators also gained access to Benkowski's storage unit and found several of Tony's collectibles in there. Some of those also had Tony's blood on them. So you'd think with this evidence that Alan would just plead guilty and accept his sentence, right? Well, I would assume so. I, I would assume so, but uh, not Alan. Alan decided that he wanted to take the stand and provide his own defense. So. He fought back tears as he elaborated on his backstory, being a high school dropout, eventually earning his GED, becoming a supervisor for Arm & Hammer, and then getting laid off in 2009. He then made money from vending machines he bought with his 401k, made some more money selling scrap metal, and mentioned that he had a lot of luck with lottery scratch-off tickets. He got a job as a truck driver. <laughs> Did your eyes just roll, Danielle? No, I'm going to pretend like they didn't, Yeah, but uh, they did real hard. <laughs> <laughs> he got a job as a truck driver for a meat company, but lost that one in 2013, and his life spiraled out of control. His girlfriend left. He started using drugs after 20 years of being sober, using between 10 to 15 bags of heroin a day. And he also mentioned that he tried to kill himself at least four times. He told the courtroom, I'm lucky to even be here. He said that he did... That I, I know, I know. <laughs> tell me, tell me what you're thinking, Danielle. That is the very last thing I would say when I am up on the stand talking about someone someone thought I murdered, saying I was lucky to be there. Wow. Doesn't it just? It's it's weird. It feels like he's trotting out. Talk about excuses, like we were starting this episode with. I mean, just every possible. You know, here's my. Hold on. You guys don't understand what my life has been. But oh man how does that tie to the fact that this man in his 70s was brutally murdered with a hammer in his home yeah <sighs> there's just there's like this disconnection this disassociation oh, with with the reality of the situation that this guy's facing and you can you mm -hmm. can tell just by how he's presenting here but uh he did say that he did know tony but they weren't close friends we didn't have each other's phone numbers we never did anything together he said he did acknowledge borrowing $40 from Tony, but said he paid it back the day before Tony was killed. He then presented his alibi for that day, that he woke up at around 5.30 a.m., snorted a couple bags of heroin, brushed his teeth, walked his dog, and then did more heroin. He said he then checked on one of his vending machines, visited his sister's house, and took his dog to a dog park, he then said he went to a flea market in English town in search of a Jamaican man he had previously bought drugs from, but when he couldn't find the Jamaican man, I mean, oh, no. I just need to take a moment because man, <laughs> oh, I, I just, how do you do this with a straight, how do you sit uh, in you, a trial and I don't, I don't know, this guy. Just, well, I sorted some heroin and then I brushed my teeth. <laughs> just, I know, just like, wake up in the morning. So casual. Wow. Oh, man. Uh, so he, he couldn't find the Jamaican man, and he decided that he had to go to Newark to buy 10 bags of heroin from a man named Rock. He said he then hung out in Newark for a little while before he headed home, went back out food shopping, and then finally returned home at approximately 7 p.m. 
He testified that he stayed home the rest of the night. In April of 2016, Benkowski was sentenced to 35 years for the murder of Tony Verduccio. In his trial for the murder of Michael Wells, his story would change. It was now being presented that his heroin addiction started with a back injury in 2013 when he was prescribed Oxycontin. His lawyer blamed the, o the opioid epidemic for the actions of his client. Thankfully, in this trial, Biankowski's excuses would only come from his attorney and not from himself. Judge Ronald Lee Reisner sentenced him to life without possibility of parole in December of 2016 after an all-female jury found him guilty. Reisner called the murders heinous and offensive crimes and said if there was a death penalty in New Jersey, I would not hesitate to put Mr. Benkowski to death. Seriously. Wow. Interestingly, he was found guilty of murder, <clears throat> felony murder, armed robbery, unlawful possession of a weapon, possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose, and receiving stolen property, but it seems like no one truly believed his alibi. There were no narcotics charges of any kind filed. I want to give a thank you to NJ.com for their coverage of this case. They were all over this case, covering it from all these different aspects. But uh, it's interesting to me that he tried to provide an alibi, but there was a bit of a problem in the prosecution didn't really define a strong time frame for knowing when Tony was attacked. And we know that Tony didn't actually expire until after his friends found him likely the next day. It could have been 24 hours, could have been 36 hours. So it's not like, um, you know, it's not like if if Benkowski could have proved that he was at his sister's house at three o'clock and Tony's attack actually happened at three, that alibi might have firmed it up. But it's almost yeah. like the fact that the prosecution didn't have that detail helped protect them from him using this alibi in some way. Oh, absolutely. Because ugh, that's just a whole entire mess to me. Yeah. Like, I don't even know where to begin, John. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I'm never, I am never, ever speechless. Yeah. Who, it's like I said before, how do you, who thinks it's a great idea to walk yourself out of one crime to admit to doing another? That's what initially grabbed me. By purchasing heroin. Yeah, that's, that's what initially grabbed me about it. But, uh, you know, I think what's clear is that when he was presenting himself, when he, he was presenting his own defense, he was trying to win over... Oh, absolutely. You know, he's playing to people's humanity. He's hoping that the jury's going to say, oh, wow, this is a guy that's been through so much. And this is a guy that's struggling with the drug addiction. And, you know, we all know someone that's struggling real bad with an addiction. Um, but in light of, so what, we're supposed to let you off because we think that you killed this 70-year-old guy. And we literally have his blood found on your shoe, your shoe prints found in his home. Uh, I mean, his items being found in your rental storage area and they're containing his blood on them. I mean, there was just so much when it comes to physical evidence with this case. I don't that's, know why his lawyer would let him even talk. That's exactly what I was about to say. If you know you have that much going against you, what what did he really think would benefit him by going up there and creating this insanely elaborate story like step by step did some heroin, brushed my teeth. Like, what did he honestly think he was going to accomplish? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, it, he, he thought this was his Hail Mary, I thought. I mean, he just, he thought this was the one way that he was going to get off. Represent myself. Tell them my story. Everyone's going to understand I've been through all this terrible stuff. Oh, and by the way, I couldn't have been there because I'm wrapped up in this <laughs> terrible drug addiction and I take such good care of my dog and I visit my sister. I take such good care of my dog. <laughs> I, I took him to the dog park that day. So yeah. what? I did a little bit of heroin before yeah. and after. He went for a I walk and to the dog park. <laughs> that, that dog got taken out twice in that day. Oh, my goodness. And then oh. how, do you, how do you prove these alibis? Are you, are you going to go get your drug dealer, Rock? That's come. exactly it. Yeah, let's bring him into the trial. Hey, Rock, let us know. Did Were you in Newark selling bags of heroin that day? And can you tell us that Mr. Benkowski actually came and bought also, from you? Also, just so you know, everything you say can and will be. <laughs> I mean, just like all in one foul swoop. Just like get it all done all in one go. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a great alibi to string together. And 
Um, you know, almost trying to think of the situation that you described. What if he was actually innocent? And what if his life was being so wrapped up in drugs that, you know, he didn't know the difference? That that you could still almost see something like I that know. applying here. But it's like the flip side. It's the same exact thing. But yeah. his turned out to be that he was very well. I, I don't want to say right in his mind because he wasn't by any means. But no, no. oh, my goodness. And, you know, the thing about that, though, is, you know, he probably went on stand thinking he made perfect sense and that you know everyone always says you know well I don't I don't understand how someone could do this or do that but when you're right. murdering something half your actions don't make sense regardless you know you're not thinking logically yeah if you're going to murder someone so probably the rest of your actions afterwards won't be very logical either yeah yeah and you're pushing past the boundaries of just what normal people experience most of the time that yeah maybe he did think that you know, he was going to pull like a Perry Mason, like he's going to get up on the stand yeah. and he's just going to win over the whole room and people are going to be crying and thanking him on their way out. I do have one more little tidbit I want to cover about this case. This is from app.com. The gun used to shoot Wells was discovered in the yard of a property where Benkowski once lived after a new family moved there following the defendant's arrest. The family had a birdhouse in a tree in the yard. When a bird fell from the birdhouse one day, the little boy who lived there wanted to find out what happened to it, and his father leaned down and found a 38 caliber revolver in the dirt, the prosecutor said. Talk so, about some stars aligning. Seriously, and that's the murder weapon. They actually thought they found the murder weapon in his rental unit. They found a gun that was in there, and yeah. he had sent a message to his sister saying, get that gun out of the rental unit or I'm screwed. <laughs> but that wasn't even the gun that was used in this case. <laughs> this is what I mean by it's just not logical. Yeah, the thinking's the just not there. The bounds of reality have been broken in this case. Oh yeah. So, but yeah, what a terrible thing, huh? You got your kid in the backyard and around the birdhouse. Oh, what's that on the ground? Yeah, it's a thirty-eight caliber revolver in the dirt. Terrible. Oh my gosh. At least the dad was there to find it because yes, yeah. there's no telling. I don't know how old that child was, but yeah, <laughs> just seriously, saying. Seriously. So as usual, we, we do have a couple of other stories, kind of brief segments we want to touch on about this topic. Uh, one of them that sprung to my mind very quickly when I started looking into alibis was Juan Cantalon. You guys know that name? You might if you watch Netflix, but uh, he spent over five months in jail charged with the murder of a 16-year-old girl. His alibi was that he was at a Dodger game. Sort of a smart one, right? You've got cameras everywhere and you're covering 56,000 people. Look, I'm that blue dot over there in the corner. That's me. Great alibi. But he was actually telling the truth. Now, thankfully, Curb Your Enthusiasm was filming at Dodger Stadium that day, and they caught him clear as day on their camera. Uh, it is an amazing story, and I highly recommend that you guys check out Long Shot. That's the name of the documentary. I think it's only about an hour long, but it's really interesting because it's not like it's footage that actually wound up in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Once again, you had a defender that worked really, really hard for his client, they reached out to the production. They got the dailies, basically the, all the extra footage that was shot that day and started looking through it. This guy just happened to be sitting in a section where he was picked up by their cameras and they proved that he was indeed there. I know. I saw this story when I was looking through things and I was just shocked because it's the same sort of situation where, you know, he knew he had a, an alibi, but, you know, he couldn't quite prove it. It's almost like, you know, you have one, but you don't have the proof for it. Yeah. Uh, just like how Lucas, you know, he, he was pretty sure, <laughs> pretty sure he didn't kill anybody, but, you know, there ended up being something he was not aware of. Um, I thought it was so insane. And I was reading deeper into the story and he he was questioned about something about, I think he went to go get someone a snack or mm -hmm. something. And that was the only reason why they actually ended up catching him, that they were trying to not let people walk back and forth and be super visible in the frame. Right. That's crazy. The chances, again, all these stars are aligning wildly in this episode of Crime After Crime. <laughs> um, it's, yeah. it's luck, man. That's so lucky because when I was reading other than that, he, man, 
Yeah. If that wasn't there, he would be in prison. And if you're a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm at all, they do actually have Larry David featured uh, talking about this case in that um, documentary as well. Long shot. So check that out. Danielle, you got one for us? Oh, man. This one is an absolute mess. And I contemplated covering him for a while. Uh, (laughs) But there was a man. um, I think he was about 22 or 23 years old. And... One night, there was this innocent man walking along the sidewalk beside a strip of bars, and he was brutally attacked. I mean, he was, his face was kicked. It was absolutely horrific. So they looked on security footage to try to see who did it. And they got a very clear shot of one man. He, um, you know, appeared to be someone that people at the bar and surrounding areas knew. So they brought this guy in. And he kept saying, this can't be me. I would never do anything like this. And then he started creating this crazy alibi out of pretty much nowhere. Originally, he kept pointing at the footage and saying, there's not a tattoo on my arm in this footage. And I have a tattoo and I got it months before this crime happened. So this can't be me because there's no tattoo there. And they didn't believe him. So they wanted him to prove an alibi. So this man went and faked an entire birthday party for himself because he claimed he got this tattoo around his birthday, which was months before. He had pictures, there was a birthday cake, there were people, there were candles, they rented out a portion of this bar. To, he provided them with all of these, you know, bits of information, these photo photographic evidence. And he's like, see, look, the tattoo's there. And this was my last birthday, which was before the crime. It couldn't have been me. Well, he didn't think about the fact that pictures oftentimes are dated. And second of all, they went and checked at the club and the club said, absolutely not. He did not rent. You know, this was just a month ago. This, this wasn't this wasn't way back when. So he ended up staging an entire birthday party to try to create an alibi out of thin air, all revolving around a tattoo. You know how when you were a kid, they talk about lies and how they, they grow and they have to stack up on each other to cover it up? It's it's like that's exactly what he went through. He had to lie about his tattoo. And then to prove that, all of a sudden, he's making a fake birthday party. <laughs> it's an absolute mess. And I've seen the pictures. Wow. Oh I, I don't know why I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head. But I'm sure if you just Googled guy staged birthday party as alibi, you will find it. He looks thrilled at his birthday party pictures. Well, and if you're going to do that, aren't you going to figure that there is a date that you want to reset on those cameras when you're taking those? But the problem is nowadays that everyone has cameras, right? It's not like you could have just had one camera, reset the date on it and taken pictures. You've got your friends that are there and all their cell phones and... Yep. You know, the, especially with photos nowadays, the, the date doesn't actually show up on the actual photo. It's in the metadata. So he might have not been thinking and they're all turning over all these photos. Oh, yeah, this is from my friend's camera and blah, blah, blah. And boom. Answer in the metadata. Nope. That was a month ago. Wow. These people are wild. That's an extreme length to throw an entire birthday party for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least he had one good party before he goes into the slammer, huh? <laughs> I know. Exactly. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed yourself. <laughs> Speaking of slammer, what about when the slammer's an alibi? Here's a little oh, story boy. for you. Daniel Taylor was a 17-year-old living in Chicago in 1992. He was brought in and questioned about the murder of two people. After hours of interrogating with no parent or lawyer present, he confessed to the crime. Later that day, he remembered that he had an alibi that he thought was ironclad. He was in jail at the time of the murders. He was arrested for disorderly conduct at 6.45 that night and released at 10 p.m. The two people were killed at 8.43. Despite that, he was convicted. Prosecutors, uh, yeah, yeah. First of all, prosecutors questioned the accuracy of the lockup log. So now they're saying that basically, yeah, law enforcement processes aren't that great. We can't trust the lockup log. Don't admit that to people. (laughs) Fix the problem first if you think that's serious. Right. And they had a confession. So they kept bringing up, hey, look, he confessed to this. And they wound up convincing a jury with that. In 2012, the Illinois Attorney General's office would investigate and they found documents proving that county prosecutors knew before his trial that he was actually in custody at the time of the shootings. Yet they improperly suppressed this evidence by burying it in their case files. He was released after 20 years in prison and declared innocent. 
He says that he only confessed because he was being beaten by the officers during his interrogation, which also wasn't recorded. He filed a wrongful conviction suit in 2014, and it appears that it's still in process. But I can tell you, um, I've seen a lot of wrongful conviction suits. For some reason, there's a lot of them that seem to be in Illinois, and they pay out millions to these guys. So he's likely, you know, for 20 years in prison, there's a very good chance he can get 15 million or more. And I mean, it's been five years since, you know, over five years since this started. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's not an easy process. Just the process itself. That's right. that one kind of like makes me feel weird. It <laughs> you should. know what I'm saying? I don't. <sighs> it's terrible. It's terrible to think that someone that didn't commit the crime is serving 20 years of his life and he's still going through this whole legal process. So <sighs> this whole thing is like a big left turn that you didn't choose for yourself, that all of a sudden your life is just redirected this way. But Absolutely. what's worse is the real killer. Where's the real killer? Exactly. I know that's terrifying. I absolutely do not like thinking about that. And I, to me, it seems so obvious that there was something wrong that I'm surprised it has taken this long for them to kind of deal with it a lot quicker. You would assume yeah. they would want to clean up their mess a lot faster than that. Yeah, you that's would. That's bad. But they have that's so really many, bad. they have so many wrongful conviction cases in that area that um, they're probably well, trying. Well, now we know why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're not going to be straight and upfront about your processes like that, just to get a conviction of someone that didn't do it, it's terrible. Um, all right. We also have a previous case update we want to give you guys real quick. And uh, on, on March 1st, Octavio sent the Twitter account a picture. I want to give a big thank you to Octavio. He had visited the LA Zoo and got a picture of the Cookie Monster. Now, the mask was on, but the costume and the bag hang hanging around his neck certainly look like a match for our craziest costumed criminal, previously known as Evil Elmo, Dan Sandler. Honestly, I'll Octavio is very brave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could get, you could, he could swing at you. You never know what, what Evil Elmo is going to do. If I saw him, man, I would pick my kids up so fast and take off running in the opposite direction. Seriously. I would freak out. <laughs> um, although Octavio did not mention if the Cookie Monster was threatening to kill people or you I know, hope not. kicking out um, slurs against uh, Jewish people or anything of that. You never know with, with that guy. But you, you thank really you. don't, which is why I would have run. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> taking that risk. <laughs> thank you, Octavio, for sending that in and uh, giving us all a little something to make us sleep uh, less easy at night. Appreciate <laughs> it. So now is the time. Who do you think is going to win? What do you, how do you feel about your story, John? Mm, I don't know, Danielle. Um, <clears throat> I, feel, I, I feel like this one is closer than last one, but I think you're going to edge me out on this one. Uh, I, mm. think, I think the angle about the DNA being contaminated, uh, I personally just did not see that coming. I think that's, that's a whole bizarre twist to this. And then including that with a good story about an alibi uh, and the fact that he didn't even know about his own alibi. I know. It's, it's it, just the amazingness of that story. <laughs> I, I feel, I mean, I know I'm voting for you. I always do. But uh, I, I feel like you might have got me beat on this one. Well, this was just, a, as we already said, a very, very hard topic. A yeah. very hard topic to research on because the stories are really all over the place once you find them. But I don't know because mine technically isn't like the worst alibi. Getting up on stand and admitting you mm. were, you know, doing heroin over and over again <laughs> in between taking great care of your dog. That to me is the worst alibi. But um, I don't know, but your guy is getting blackout drunk and falling guy. down. <laughs> no, yeah, aisle. he's just a mess all over. I feel so bad for him personally. And I'm telling yeah. you, his picture, he's just this man. He's just standing underneath the tree. He looks so sad. And all I can picture is mm. him being like, well, I don't think I did it. Yeah. And like, imagine questioning yourself like that. Yeah, that's another thing. That I feel like rough. in my story, the guy kind of got what he deserved, especially after that nonsense of him taking the stand and trotting out his his sad story for everyone. But um, I don't know. I don't know. But what that, do you? 
I still think, though, I'm still voting for you and not just because I always vote for you, <laughs> but that is the worst alibi I think I've ever heard <laughs> because I, I saw a lot of bad excuses. Right, right. But that saying yeah. you were off buying heroin instead. I mean, it's like I said, you don't walk out of one door and right into another of another crime. He just seems like a ding dong. And I think that is the <laughs> worst alibi I have ever heard. I so, don't know how I find these guys, but my stories, yeah, either the people are like super brilliant, like Mr. Lovejoy or they're evil Elmo. And I went to buy heroin instead of murder this guy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, me and John can go through this all day, but you guys actually get to have the final say. Right now is a great time for you to go ahead and vote up in the top corner. And keep in mind that you can also go and vote on our Twitter page at Crime After Pod for the next seven days. And let us know who had the world's worst alibi. Absolutely. And for next month's episode, we've got something real special planned. What happens in May, Danielle? Mother's Day. Mother's Day. So a big thank you once again to Cheeks Makeup. Uh, she sent in an amazing list, and I think this is the second one we've used from that list. We are going to do murdering mother-in-laws. What do you think, this Danielle? topic scares me. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's going to be as hard of a research job as this one? Oh, honestly, this is going to sound terrible, but probably not. Yeah, I don't think it would be either. <laughs> I think it's going to be a little easier, but we'll see. Um, so I hate murdering, to admit that. Yeah. I hate to admit that. Yeah. Murdering mother-in-law is coming on May 1st. <clears throat> If you guys want more content from us, you can find John and I on our YouTube channels or our social media. You can follow my YouTube channel at Danielle Hallen. It should pop up right away or my Twitter at Danielle Hallen as well. And I'm at Lord and Arts. That's L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S. You can just search on that in YouTube or in Twitter and you will find me. If you have ideas for the show like Cheeks Makeup did, uh, you can email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or you can visit us on Twitter at crimeafterpod. Let us know your idea. Maybe it'll pop up in a future episode. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And as always, we want to say a massive thank you to our patrons. They're what allow us to have limited ads on YouTube and no ads at all on audio. We also give our patrons a special Patreon bonus every single month. And I'm telling you what, we get into some serious deep questions. You get to see an awesome part of us that you wouldn't get to see anywhere else. And John and I may or may not have a really hard time staying on topic, but we, we <laughs> still make sure fault. it's very entertaining. <laughs> and plus, every single new patron gets a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. That's right. And if you enjoy Crime After Crime, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. We need your help growing. We cannot do it without your help. Tell your friends. Friends, tell your family, tell everyone about crime after crime. And don't forget, we also have a merch store. I'm working on a few more things. You guys actually said you really wanted phone cases, so I'm looking into it. I hear you. Just give me a little bit, but you can check that out at teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. But we will see you guys next time on Crime After Crime. Bye-bye. <laughs>